Today I'll be talking about Francis Hutchinson, an essay on the nature and conduct of passions and affections with illustrations on the moral sense. Let's look. Francis Hutchinson's basic argument is that we have what he calls an internal moral sense. You'll hear that this is very different from Mandeville, and in fact, Mandeville is one of his big enemies in this book who he's, um, who he's addressing. Hutchinson's philosophy is also behind sentimentalism to some extent, although there are definitely differences and there are ways in which sentimentalism takes this in different directions and there are differences within sentimentalism, but it is true that Hutchinson's thinking is behind some of the basic tenets of what we now call sentimentalism. He believed that virtue was apparent. His most famous student, who was Adam Smith, would go on to reshape Hutchison's theories into thinking about sympathy. But you'll notice that sympathy actually doesn't play a big role in at least this particular work of Hutchinson's. It becomes very important in sentimentalism later, and it also becomes important in Adam Smith. But Hutchison is actually going after something something else. He's, he's interested in human nature, which is, of course, something that Mandeville is interested in, in as well. And Mandeville has, some would say he has a very dark view of human nature. Another way to think about it is that he doesn't really see humans as strictly distinct from other animals. He sees a continuity. So animals are hungry, they eat something. Humans are hungry, they eat something. They, they want something, they go after it. So for Hutchinson though, he thinks that he's trying to refute Man Mandeville's idea of the prevalence of desire being located in the body, which is crucial for Mandeville. And that these bodily desires are actually kind of morally neutral for Mandeville and humans are inclined to indulge them and when they do indulge them sometimes they hurt themselves like if they drink too much gin they'll they want more gin they keep drinking gin they get really sick they become impoverished they spend all their money on gin and they can endanger their health endanger their families but Lots of people drinking a lot of gin is kind of good for the society as a whole because much gin is sold. And so that is the reason why it doesn't implode, I think, in, in Mandeville, why um, lacking virtue doesn't end in economic collapse, which was actually the argument of the societies for the reformation of the manners who believed that God was watching England and would punish nations that failed to be virtuous. And Mandeville's trying to refute that. But Hutchison's trying to refute Mandeville because Hutchison is saying that um, humans actually tend to follow virtue. And the reason they follow virtue is because virtue makes them happy. And virtue is... Um, I'm not sure I can fully define it in the way Hutchison is saying what virtue is, but it's it often means caring about others and doing things that support the community. So doing things for other people and acting on your benevolence, which Hutchison thinks we have a natural, where humans are naturally benevolent, whereas Manville doesn't think that. But virtue is hard to define in Hutchison because we internally know what it is. We have what he calls, and we, and what I'm going to go on to talk about is a moral sense, that we have an internal sense of what is morally correct and what is not. So therefore, it is the emotions that are a guide to morality. So that I think in Hutchinson, emotions themselves don't really have a moral significance, but emotions can guide us to correct moral actions. And for Hutchison, interestingly, and in maybe in ways I won't have time to really fully explore in, in this video, 
Hutchison also wrote a lot about beauty in the aesthetic and not it does come up in, in this work. It's not the center of this work, but it comes up in it. And he also believes that humans are drawn to um, to the aesthetic. They're drawn to beauty. They're drawn to particularly symmetry and regularity. And he was not alone in, in thinking this in the 18th century. You'll see a lot of it actually in The Spectator as well. Closely studying a lot of art actually refines our moral sense for Hutchinson so that art is related to creating better, better human beings. And he talks at one point about how young people make a lot of mistakes and a lot of times they make those mistakes because it's before they have been fully educated in, in the arts. And, and this idea that somehow the arts are good for you, that make you a better person, has, has stuck and has uh, had some lasting force in Western society, although um, it is perhaps uh, on shaky ground right now, being attacked in multiple, by, in multiple directions, but it is, it was a, a driving force in the 18th century of why the arts were good for, good for society and why, for example, uh, a government would subsidize an artistic project because it makes people better to be exposed to art and to appreciate art. And Hutchison would be all in for that. Mandeville would be like, no way. You, you're, you're a sucker if you think that. that that's what Mandeville would say. So harmony can be appreciated in nature and that elevates your moral sense by appreciating nature and that art, the best art for Hutchison reproduces the beauty and I think he would say the symmetry and regularity of nature. And so it reproduces, it has this similar moral function. So I wanna to return to this issue that I mentioned before about the senses. So we all have this idea right now that we have five senses, but for Hutchinson, senses were divided in a different way. All kind of, um, all of those five senses that we think of, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and seeing, all of those senses are one sense, which he calls ex the external sense, the sense that allows us to perceive external reality. And so we see beautiful things, we hear beautiful music, we smell a flower, we activate all of these senses for access to the external. But that's only one sense for Hutchinson. There's, there's three others. Um, the second sense is um, the aesthetic sense. And he believes that we have, uh, that we're, we're just drawn to harmonious objects. And so we enjoy um, beautiful, beautiful gardens when they're laid out in some regularity. And then we appreciate the flowers within the garden that are harmonious in themselves. And if you create a garden with balance and um, some sort of aesthetic organization, anyone will be able to appreciate it. You don't actually have to, this is something that Mr. Spectator talks about too in his series of essays called The Pleasures of the Imagination, which are, which are really wonderful. I recommend them. But he also talks about how you can experience this pleasure and it is distinct from property because you don't have to own the garden to actually enjoy the garden. Whereas the person who owns the garden, according to Hutchison anyway, gets most of his pleasure by people complimenting him on the garden. But the people who walk by and look at the garden are actually in a better position because they're appreciating the garden directly rather than having their um, ego boosted by someone else complimenting them on having created their garden. So that's the aesthetic sense, which we have, um, which is internal. And Hutchison says, beauty, decency, and harmony on page 74. So notice that decency is just part of, part of the harmony of art and nature. And we have an internal aesthetic sense that will draw us to the, this kind of harmony. 
Our third sense is what he calls a public sense. And that is an internal impulse to please others so that we're not just interested in enjoying something beautiful. We want to create beautiful things for other people. We want to contribute to our families, to our communities. We want to do something good for the world. We want to change the world. We're idealistic for Hutchinson. This is um, all part, all comes from um, this third sense called um, the, the public sense, which is not just you know, that you want to um, run for office or do something, you know, good for the community, but it can also mean something simple. Like if you have two donuts, give one of them to somebody else. That's a public sense because it's that you would just enjoy giving the donut to somebody else rather than eating both donuts. Of course, men will eat both donuts, right? So, we have so so finally, and this is the, this is like I think kind of the big one for for Hutchison or his major contribution, is that we have a moral sense. So we're born with an internal sense of what is what is moral and what's not moral. And how can we tell that we have this? You ask. You ask, Mr. Hutchison. And so what he would say is that when you're going to do something bad, you feel uneasy. And so you, so emotions point toward your um, moral sense. So emotions are indicators of when you're doing something wrong. So, um, so with the public sense is, is an important one of our senses, but it doesn't fully account for our generosity that we have toward others. And that generosity comes from, comes from our moral sense. So for example, if you know, we walk into a room and somebody has left their beautiful gold watch on the table and nobody's looking and maybe we want to take the watch because we don't have a watch. And so, and so, Maybe, maybe some people would take the watch, but what Hutchinson says is that even when you start thinking about taking the watch, you start to feel uneasy. So that's your internal moral sense manifesting itself in emotions and pointing toward the morally proper thing to do, which doesn't mean that you would never take the watch under any circumstances but it means that you do have an internal moral sense and that you know that it's, that it's wrong to, um, to actually do that. And so Hutchison says that that actually kicks in for, for anything. Um, yes, I know he doesn't account for sociopaths. I, I think a sociopath is just not really possible in Hutchison. He does often qualify it by saying most people are like this. So perhaps he has, has in mind some exceptions. I don't know, I have to read a little deeper into Hutchinson and criticism, see what he thinks of that. He argues that benevolence is uh, natural to us. Um, benevolence being kindness and generosity. So that's a natural human impulse is um, benevolence. And so we do have these desires that are, are not benevolent, like Ooh, look at that watch. I'd like a watch. I should just take that watch. So what Hutchinson says is that your desire for the watch is actually something you can't help. You just have that desire and desires are natural. But what does happen is that your moral sense kicks in and that you are actually able to regulate your desires. So Hutchinson acknowledges desires. He does not argue for judging people according to their desires. He just argues that everyone needs to learn how to regulate their, their desires. And part of this is because in Hutchison, humans are only happy in a community. So human happiness is based on being, being part of a community, which is not something that all philosophers have, have argued. A lot of them have argued that, you know, you find happiness internally. But Hutchison, and actually this is a lot of the 
Scottish Enlightenment philosophers felt this, and Enlightenment philosophers in general felt that community was the source of happiness and that people are not happy on, on their own. And um, we just need to keep our passions in balance in order to be fully part of one of these communities. There are negative passions in Hutchinson, but even these negative passions are, are actually are actually not that bad because we're, we're naturally benevolent. Um, envy, for example, he argues that envy is actually not driven by malice and that when you're envious, the point is less the desire for the other person's misery than it is for the thing that they have. So envy really just means that you want something that somebody else has and it doesn't mean you wish ill on the person who possesses it. That's actually something of a controversy in contemporary psychology, but but Hutchison thinks that you can actually have envy that is that doesn't break the fundamental human benevolence and it just means that you want something that you don't have or that somebody else has. Had. Has. As Adam Swift would do later, Hutchinson turns to theater to explore these emotions and actually to demonstrate his the rightness of his of his argument. So he argues that um, we form the idea of a morally good action by seeing it represented on stage or in romance. So you, part of what you get at the theater is a model for, for actions that you're drawn to. And, and that, to him, explains why certain plots in, in theater are organized the way they are. So a tragedy wouldn't work, he argues, if good people suffer. If it's just about good people suffering in a tragedy because then we would lose faith in, in providence. And um, the success of evil characters is also unfit for tragedy because um, also the, because the prospect of good things coming to a malicious person um, would be aversive to the audience. They wouldn't like it. And so you wouldn't get your play produced if you wrote a play like that, or people wouldn't, would not like that play. They wouldn't learn anything from it. And an imperfect character, he argues, if you have an imperfect character who gets more than he deserves, that's just going to raise envy in the audience and that's going to be unpleasant. So they're not going to, they're not going to like that play either. So that the best plots, he argues, are where agents themselves procure their own misery. That's what he said. Like, for example, in Oedipus. Of course, Oedipus is fascinating because Oedipus doesn't know he's procuring his own mi misery. And that's what, of course, you know, makes it so powerful, but his misery is not brought to him by somebody else. It's actually um, generated by him in, internally. And so what he argues is that the most moving parts of theater or of the epic, um, epic poetry, although theater is really his focus, are gratitude, Gratitude, love, esteem, and forgiveness. And when you see these things on stage, you're emotionally moved. And that's why they're repeated again and again on stage. And that's why plays like that are enjoyable. So it goes a little beyond poetic justice. So I'll just say a few words about poetic justice. It's a little digressive, but people use that term all over the place. and They don't know where it comes from. But poetic justice was a term coined by Thomas Reimer at the end of the 17th century, who was a um, playwright and a literary critic. And his argument was essentially that in a good play, the malicious characters have to lose and the virtuous characters have to win, and that that is poetic justice. And that's another concept from this period that's really stuck with us. People use that phrase all the time, poetic justice. And so, we actually kind of often assume poetic justice in, in literature, even when it isn't there. And so we look for poetic justice, like why did that character have to die? 
you know, it's because of X, Y, and Z. And so a lot of times, um, poetic justice is really central to the way literature, literature operates. And when, when it isn't, it's remarkable. So literary critics often think that they can reveal the true purpose of the author by looking at which characters win and which characters lose at the end and saying that the characters who lose are the ones that the author intends for us to condemn, which is actually not always true, but that is often assumed by, assumed by readers. Uh, so here's another, maybe a brief turn away from Hutchinson, but just to kind of think about why is there so much analysis of passion in this period? And why is there so much debate about whether or not the passions are morally based? And I, I know this has been a question before, the 18th century wasn't the first, but people at this time, like philosophers, and I think novelists as well, more philosophically bent novelists like Eliza Haywood, really kind of were working through this question all the time. And so we might wonder why. And um, okay, nobody knows, but here's a couple of possible ideas. One might be secularization, which is a long process and very controversial. Not everybody thinks that secularization really took place, but I happen to think that even though people did not become more secular, and of course Hutchinson is um, you know, clearly connected to Christianity, and he talks about providence and God, really more providence than God. But I think in the 18th century, it became possible to think outside of religion or to think in ways that were kind of next to religion, in a way to think about ways in which religion didn't cover all of the philosophical landscape. So that's how I think about secularization. It's, um, it becomes possible to have a Hobbes and a Mandeville. Not that everybody's Hobbes and Mandeville. It just becomes possible to do that without getting in really big trouble. Although Mandeville, of course, was attacked, but um, it's okay to be attacked. So, so another suggestion for this is that um, I, I think there also might be some kind of loss of moral compass in this period and perhaps related to an expanding empire and the practice of enslaving other people. And I know slavery doesn't come up directly in these philosophical texts, but I always wonder like, why are they thinking, why now? Why are they thinking about this, about how, if people are basically benevolent or they're not benevolent, if their nation is now kind of engaged in this human traffic at a pretty increasing scale in the 18th century. So that's one possibility. And then the third possibility is that this global commerce that 18th century traders were highly involved in brought them into contact with more diversity of human culture and human opinion so that they needed to kind of sort things out a little bit and that you couldn't assume certain things that had long been assumed. So those are possibilities. I'm sure there's more. So other people have theories about this too. So back to Hutchinson. Okay. There is no malice. Humans are basically benevolent. So the passions themselves are not um, in our power, but, um, but we need to regulate our passions. He argues that we rarely find motives in humans that are worse than self-love. So he knows that people do bad things, but he thinks that they do this out of selfishness, not out of malice, and that malice itself is fairly rare, and that even selfishness is fairly rare in, um, in Hutchinson. He said that people seek power. He admits that they seek power. He's read his Manville and his Hobbes. He observes that they seek power, but he thinks that people don't really want power for itself. They want it for some kind of future benefit that they can squirrel away for when, when they need it. And so, um, and, and again, like such sort of 
lowly desires for for power and for and out of self-love emerge when young people have not cultivated yet a desire for things like music painting and poetry which are better than ultimately better than power in his view and that he points out that selfishness is often attended with shame and so there's the uh, moral sense kicking in and so um Virtuous pleasure, he concludes, is superior to all other pleasures. And this is, of course, an attack on Mandeville and others at his time, but um, definitely on Mandeville. And that friendship and honor provide the greatest pleasures and that this is something that is not fully recognized in youth, but as people get older, they recognize that these are the best, best kind of pleasures violate moral sense. If you violate your own moral sense, it, it never heals. And so that is um, why people don't violate their moral sense as often as you think they would. So I'm going to return really briefly now to thinking about what Adam Smith does with this. And I only gave you like a very small passage from Adam Smith, but I want to talk a little bit about Smith because he's important for the 18th century. For Smith, there's less of an internal moral sense than something that he calls the impartial spectator. Smith was persuaded by a lot of what Hutchison said, but not all of it. So you can think of Smith's work called The Theory of Moral Sentiment as a commentary and a response to Hutchison. Smith says that people behave themselves morally. For him, it's not so much about this moral sense, but of this imagined external figure called an impartial spectator, which is not a literal impartial spectator because the person or the spectator, we don't really know if it's a person. Some people have argued that it's a substitute for God. I, I don't think that's true. I think it's because he's so interested in community. I think it's like, if there was another person. And so when you're about to do something, what goes through your head is, you know, you're about to steal the watch. What goes through your head is, well, no one can actually see me, but what would an impartial spectator looking at this situation think? Would that impartial spectator judge me harshly or judge me in a, in a way that I would welcome? So I'm gonna not steal the watch because I'm imagining as somebody looking at me, even if somebody isn't looking at me, I'm always imagining that. And so for Smith, as for Hutchison, human happiness is founded in, in this sense of community. And so um, there's an internal moral sense. And for Smith, this is really organized about humans behave themselves out of a kind of shame of being watched watched by others, even when others are not watching.